Uh, so this first slide is just a title slide, uh, introducing me and the topic uh, with this picture uh, that I like to use as an introduction to RNA sequencing that was created by <coughs> a colleague of mine, Rodrigo Goya in Vancouver, showing a pre-mRNA molecule uh, being spliced into a mature RNA molecule, uh, and then short reads being generated from that uh, RNA by some kind of next generation approach, uh, and then those reads being mapped back to the RNA to show what a, 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 a split read alignment looks like when it's spanning across an exon-exon boundary. We're going to talk a lot more about the details of, of that process throughout this presentation. Uh, and please do feel free to ask questions as we go. So just briefly to outline the goals of this module, uh, basically we'll try to introduce you to the theory and practice of RNA sequencing. For some of you, presumably this will be sort of a review. But basically, we'll try to go over the rationale, some of the challenges and common questions that come up in RNA sequence experiments. Um, the idea of this whole uh, tutorial and lecture is to try to act as a practical resource for those that are new to the topic of RNA sequence analysis. Uh, and with that goal in mind, uh, I provide a working example of an analysis pipeline. Uh, and this is supposed to be generally self-contained uh, so that you should be able to take it away and run it again on your own time. <coughs> Uh, and there are many different types of analyses we can do with RNA-seq data, but as our uh, example workflow is going to be based on gene expression and differential expression. So just as a quick review uh, of the biology, for most of you I'm sure this will be uh, well understood, but just so that we're all on the same page, I usually show this uh, cartoon of gene, ex gene expression starting with double-stranded genomic DNA template. Uh, which has various features uh, that we'll talk about uh, in terms of gene annotation. So in this example, you have three exons and two introns, and those exons uh, have features as a promoter region and so on. Uh, this region of the genome gets transcribed into a single stranded pre-mRNA molecule, which still has the introns intact. Uh, there are additional features on that pre-mRNA molecule that allow the splicing machinery to recognize where the exons start and end and where, where the introns need to be removed. Uh, once this RNA processing occurs, you have a mature mRNA that's been capped and polydentylated and the exons have been assembled, uh, and this thing will get exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm to be converted into protein, translated into protein, which will then be folded. Uh, so the, really the main point of showing this is to, fo to, to note that we're really focusing on this type of molecule. For the most part, RNA-seq libraries, at least the, most of the ones I've seen, are generated from uh, polyadenylated mRNA. So someone has isolated total RNA and they've enriched for poly -A RNA and they've made cDNA from those RNAs and fragmented them. But of course, variations of that strategy are possible. So this slide shows sort of an overview of the whole process of RNA sequencing. Um, where analysis is just kind of a black box, uh, but starting with some samples of interest. So in our tutorial, we're going to use two samples. Uh, they're both uh, from colon. One is a colon tumor, and the other is a matched normal uh, piece of colon tissue from which RNA was isolated. Uh, and that RNA was used to generate cDNA. The cDNAs were then fragmented into smaller pieces, uh, and those uh, cDNA fragments had linkers attached uh, and they were selected to be approximately a, a, a particular size, and usually that size is in the range of about 250 base pairs. Those fragments would then float across an Illumina flow cell, which is shown here with uh, eight lanes. Uh, and this is an image uh, from the flow cell being analyzed. Uh, and the Illumina generated hundreds of millions of paired end reads, uh, which comes out to tens of billions of bases of sequence. And now what's, what's being depicted here is sort of a, a cartoon version of a paired end read where you've got a blue and a red uh, box connected by a dot. So that's meant to represent read one and read two of a read pair with some uh, space in between them, uh, which is variably called the insert size or the mate inner distance uh, or a variety of other terms. Uh, but basically you have these two reads that are correspond to the ends uh, of these cDNA fragments that we started with. Um, and this is going to be the raw data that we're going to be starting with. So we're going to start with files that contain millions and millions of lines, that rep each one of which represents uh, either read one or read two um, of a paired end read. Uh, 
we're going to take those reads and we're going to map them to a combination of the genome, the transcriptome, and uh, exon junctions. Uh, and then we're going to do downstream analysis on those mapped reads. So any questions on that? Yeah. Could I just make sure about one thing? The reason you use paired reads is that it's taking the entire feed in it. Is that Sorry? Is that to save resources? Um, initially, it was because the read lengths generated by next gen sequencing instruments are not long enough to accommodate. So there, if the read can only be 40 base pairs long, you don't really want to be sequencing 80 base cDNA fragments because they're, they're kind of too small. And you, you get more information by having short reads that correspond to the ends of a fragment that's larger. Um, we're starting to get back to the point where the read lengths are approaching the length where we can actually sequence from one end and the other end and where the sequences might actually meet in the middle. And then in a sense, they, they are still paired end reads, but in a sense, they aren't. Uh, if effectively you can have one read being generated. And we're sort of at the transition where people are starting to think about whether we should make our fragments larger so that we still get paired end reads and what are the, con what are the advantages and disadvantages of that. Um, but yeah, it's basically a technological limitation. The reads start initiate from linkers inwards. They each have yes a common linker, a read one linker and a read two linker. So read one is from one end, and read two from that end. Yes. So they're they're facing each other. Anything else? It depends on the sequencing technology. So there are different, there are sort of paired, paired reads that are in a different orientation than the orientation that's being depicted here. Uh, so for example, in um, PacBio has an instrument that does a concept of strobe reading where they read and then stop reading and then continue reading and those reads wind up being facing the same direction. And if you have two of them, you might kind of think of them as paired reads. And you, can, and you can do multiple strobes. You could have a read one, two, three, four, and they would all be the same direction. If you make your, uh, instead of making uh, cDNA fragments and putting reads on either end, if you make uh, a mate pair library instead, which involves circularizing DNA and then cutting a piece out, you can wind up with the effective orientation of the reads being different again. So it does depend. And it's something to think about when, when you first get some new data is to understand how that data was generated and whether the orientation of the two reads is what you think it is. So you'll have two sets of reads that each one, one file will correspond to all of the read ones and one file will correspond to all of the read twos and in each case those will match up. So you'll have one read for, for the first part of this fragment and one read for the second part of that fragment for every fragment. But the read one could be either blue or red in this case. I mean this is just a, an abstraction, I mean they're not... <laughs> Yeah, there's, you don't know what, you don't know anything about the orientation of the, so maybe you're getting at sort of strandedness. There's no strand, strandedness to a lot of these libraries. It's just you randomly sequence from one end and the other end. Okay, so I put this slide up because often I'm in a crowd where there's actually not that many people interested in RNA-seq analysis and a lot of people doing mutation calling or other things really, like copy number analysis, structural variant detection in DNA, and usually there's like three or four out of like 20 people that are interested in RNA-seq. Uh, so I have sort of some rationale slides for why you would sequence RNA, but it sounds like I don't really need to convince this audience, but I mean, I'll go through it quickly anyways just because it's interesting to think about. Um, but basically, from a biological perspective, why you would sequence RNAs, 
uh, for functional reasons. So there's experiments that you could easily design where the genome may be constant, but some experimental condition is having some effect at the transcriptome level. So you could imagine a cell line where you have drug-treated versus untreated state, and effectively the genome of that cell line is static, um, but the transcriptome may be changing radically in response to the drug. Um, similar with uh, mouse models uh, and many other uh, model systems that you could think of. Uh, there are definitely some molecular features that can only be observed at the RNA level. So, for example, alternative isoforms, fusion transcripts, and RNA editing are really only observable at the level of the RNA. So you can sequence DNA all day long and not really learn that much about them. In particular, predicting the trans transcript sequences from the genome is very difficult. And there was sort of a field of bioinformatics that attempted to do this for a long time, sequencing genomes, analyzing the features of the genome, and trying to predict what transcripts would look like. Um, for a variety of reasons, this was deemed to be an uh, a sort of a, an efficient approach or uh, something to do when you didn't have an alternative, uh, but it's very difficult. It's much easier, if you can, to just sequence the transcriptome and align it back to a reference genome or assemble it de novo. Not to say that those things are easy, but it's easier. Um, and also, there's sort of there's d circumstances where it's very useful to combine RNA-seq data and uh, whole genome or exome data, so for example, interpreting mutations uh, that might not have an obvious effect on the protein sequence, so for example, regulatory mutations, you may identify in, your, in a tumor, say, that you have some mutation, doesn't appear to occur in an exon, and therefore you're not quite sure what its function is. If you sequence the transcriptome, you may find that it affects the expression level of a nearby transcript, uh, and then you've been able to assign a, a putative function to that mutation. And there's a variety of sort of categories of regulatory mutations that would fit into that category. Uh, another scenario is prioritizing protein coding somatic mutations. This is probably one of the, the most straightforward things that people are doing by combining transcriptome and whole genome data is to uh, identify mutations in the genome and then determine which of those mutations are actually expressed in the transcriptome and to what level to help you prioritize a list of mutations. So you can, in theory, sort of bin your mutations into those that are in genes that are perhaps not expressed at all in your tissue and therefore they might not be as interesting. Uh, and then you have this notion of allele-specific expression where the gene may be expressed but perhaps only the wild-type allele is expressed and that perhaps might suggest uh, that the mutation is a loss of function uh, or haploinsufficiency. If the mutant allele uh, is expressed preferentially, on the other hand, that might be a good candidate uh, for a drug target, or it might be a higher priority mutation for further study. Are there any tools for a specific uh, uh, expression? There are definitely papers that have been written about it. There are like alignment strategies that are sort of tailored towards it. I'm not aware of any tools that really specifically take a combination of whole genome and transcriptome data and sort of have a push button, here's your allele-specific expression of vari variation results. Um, I would be interested to know if someone does know of such a tool, though. It's probably only a matter of time, though. I guess I'm supposed to be repeating these questions, right? <laughs> OK, so let's move on to the challenges. So some of the challenges that relate to RNA-seq relate to the sample itself. Um, so purity, quantity, and quality seem to always be an issue when you're dealing with RNA. Um, another sort of uh, feature of genomes is that RNAs consist of small exons that are in species like human or mammals tend to be separated by very large introns. So we're going to do all of our tutorials based on human, uh, and you'll see that mapping the reads can be quite challenging. And the reason is that you have these short reads and short exons, and you're trying to match them up, but then you have these huge introns uh, in between, so it can be hard to, to identify correctly when a read spans across an exon-exon boundary if you've got a couple small exons and then 50,000 bases of intronic sequence in between. Another issue that doesn't really come up when you're sequencing DNA is the relative uh, abundance of the species that you're sequencing. So in DNA, there is some variation because of copy number variation, but basically you expect approximately a uniform coverage of reads across the genome. So this was mentioned in uh, uh, Michael Prudno's talk yesterday. Uh, in RNA, you don't expect that to be the case at all. So the, 
uh, a lowly expressed RNA and a highly expressed RNA uh, are in a very different category. So the, the range of relative abundance of RNAs varies wildly, and you'll hear estimates that are anywhere from 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 7. I think in this, this paper here, Trapnell actually quotes uh, 10 to the 10, so from 1 to 10 to the 10. So you can have a, a biologically functional transcript that's present in a few copies per cell, uh, and another, the next gene over, uh, in order for it to bi be biologically functional, you need tens of thousands of copies in that cell. Uh, and this creates a challenge for sequencing, uh, because RNA sequencing works by random sampling. So we're going to basically be grabbing reads randomly from these fragments that were generated from a pool of RNA, uh, but the highly expressed RNAs are really going to consume a lot of our reads. So when we randomly pull these fragments out, we tend to pull the same fragments over and over and over again. Uh, and we may wind up having to sequence much deeper than we would hope uh, to accurately profile lowly expressed transcripts. Yeah. Is there a reason why we only detect the mature RNAs and not read the pre-MRNAs? Is there a reason that we only detect mature mRNAs and not uh, unprocessed RNAs? Um, I guess the first answer to that is that, of course, we don't just detect mature mRNAs. It, it, we enrich for them to simplify the, the search space, but they're still there it's in some amount. So we'll definitely be sequencing some amount of unprocessed RNA. If for some reason you had a particular interest in uh, the processing of RNA, then you might make your library in a different way that actually didn't enrich for polyadenylated mature mRNAs. and. That's just a choice of the experimental design. Um, but there can be challenges associated with that because one of the ways to improve uh, the, the challenge of this situation is to remove some of the most highly expressed transcripts. Um, and a lot of those really highly expressed transcripts are not polyadenylated. So by doing the polyadenylation, you remove a lot of uh, redundancy in your sample. And it, it helps with this problem that you don't have to sequence quite as deeply. Um, but there's no reason why you can't uh, make your library in a different way that would be suitable to that kind of experiment. Uh, similar to the relative abundance issue, um, RNAs also come in a wide range of sizes. So if you're sequencing human chromosomes, generally they're all just very large, and you don't think about much about their, their relative sizes. But for when you're profiling RNAs, you do tend to think about what size they are um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that there are some functional RNAs that are very small, and because of the way we make the libraries, they may not be captured effectively. So there's, a, as far as I know, not really a great library uh, preparation method that will cover all types of RNAs. Generally, what people are doing now is creating uh, one library for mRNA and a sec separate library or a series of libraries, in some cases, for small RNAs. Uh, in particular, microRNAs tend to be treated sort of as a completely separate problem. Uh, and also related to the size, for very large RNAs, because RNA is fairly fragile, if you do a polyase selection, you may lose the five prime ends of larger RNAs. So if you think about uh, a bunch of RNAs floating around in solution, if some of those RNAs have been broken in one or more places and you grab onto the three prime end of them and then wash everything else away, you will lose some five prime ends of some species. And the overall result in your library is that you'll have bias towards the uh, three prime end of your transcripts. And this is very common in RNA libraries that you'll see increased coverage towards the three prime end of transcripts. Uh, in particular if you've done a poly A selection or if your library construction somehow involves priming off of a poly A tail. So, so given all these challenges, uh, if there's a sequencing center that wants to try RNA-seq, they want to try a control to see how good they are at it. Are there um, data sets uh, that are publicized that you could judge your results against to say, yes, we are or how well would you expect to do in terms of reproduction and all these challenges? There are a lot of RNA-seq data sets that have been published. They're very heterogeneous in the way that they were made, the library construction techniques that were used. 
the sequencing technology that was applied, the read lengths, the fragments, so many variables that it, one of the challenges will be finding something that's similar to what you intend to do with the current state of the art. Um, so, what about like a sort of a control set, say, that's very well described? Yeah, so what, I think what a lot of people do there is they, they get RNA from a cell line that's been well characterized that a lot of other centers perhaps are also sequencing. So in our lab, we use LINCAP, which is a prostate cancer cell line, and we just sequence the, it to death. Um, and every time we, make, we try a different poly A selection strategy or we get a different kit for making cDNA or we want to experiment with some uh, significantly different analytical approach, we kind of go back to that, that RNA or that data. Uh, and I think a lot of places will, will take that strategy. Um, and the nice thing about doing, working with the cell line is that you have a basically unlimited supply of high quality RNA. Or you, or you can purchase RNA uh, in large quantities as well. Sometimes the same library you sequence twice, you will find different outcomes. Especially if you don't sequence it the same way. Yeah. <laughs> so why the bias in the treatment? Don't you just dilute the entire thing? What is the If you do a poly A selection, you may have washed away five prime ends in a degraded library. If the library is not degraded, then it should not be an issue. But the larger, so say you have a 20,000 nucleotide long transcript and you have some amount of, even a low level amount of degradation in your RNA, the probability that a break occurred is higher in a large long sequence than it is in a short sequence. So very, very small RNAs, you don't worry as much about RNA degradation because they're but, smaller. But you'll notice it because uh, the breaks will be random, so you'll have five prime ends will be different copies, different, uh, different reads will have uh, different random ends. Yes, they will have different random ends, but you're always grabbing onto the three prime end, so you will tend to have lower, gradually lower cap coverage on average as you get out to the five prime end. Uh, and it's common, it's a common sort of QC measure in uh, RNA-seq labs to produce uh, an end bias profile or something that's called something similar like that, where you basically plot the coverage that you observe in your reads across transcripts of different sizes from the five, five prime end to the three prime end, and you'll see a sort of uh, horseback shaped curve where you don't get very good coverage at the ends. And in a really degraded library, you'll see a big peak or spike at the three prime end and a, and a kind of tail going out to the five prime end where you're getting progressively lower coverage on average. Uh, this, if you get that, does that affect the mapping in order to so the question is, if you get end bias, does it affect the mapping or the stats of your expression? It will definitely have the potential, I mean, you'll, it won't affect your ability to map the reads. The reads you get will still be mappable. Um, you will probably still be able to get good gene expression estimates. You can get great gene expression estimates just by specifically profiling the three prime end of transcripts. I mean, that's the basis of a lot of the Affymetrix microarray. Uh, designs or uh, SAGE libraries are basically focusing on the three prime end of transcripts. So you can get gene expression estimates, but you will not be able to effectively profile the status of mutations that occur across the length of the transcript. You might not be able to assemble full length transcripts together if you're trying to determine what your transcript structures actually look like. You may miss alternative splicing events. And in terms of comparing two libraries, if the degree of end bias is variable, and this will happen, it, this tends to happen because each, say you have 20 patient samples and they're all, all of those samples are from a, a clinical setting and they're all degraded to different amounts, they each have this effect to a different level. So that introduces bias in terms of your differential expression analysis. So it's definitely of concern. You, if you do have it, you want it to at least be consistent across the libraries you intend to compare. In terms of the RNA purity, is there a sort of cutoff as to when you um, why don't I go to the next slide where I'm showing an example of an Agilent QC. So the, the question is whether there's a, cut, a cutoff in terms of purity or, qu or quality uh, in your RNA where you wouldn't want to even go forward with RNA sequencing. And it's, 
unfortunately not necessarily a simple answer to, uh, question to answer. Um, but I'll start by showing this example of uh, an Agilent trace. So this is the output from an assay called the Agilent uh, 2100 Nano or RNA 5000 or something. It's got a big long name. But basically what it is is you're running uh, RNA samples through uh, a device, which is an Agilent lab on a chip. And this is a very common way that people QC RNA libraries. How many people here are familiar with this assay? Okay, so quite a few of you. But basically the idea is you're, you're running a gel effectively. So in the good old days, people would get an RNA sample and they would run a gel and they would look at how smeared the RNA was to get a sense of how degraded it was. If it's not degraded, you'll get two really bright bands near where you would expect the size for whatever species uh, ribosomal species are. So for human, you expect them to be at a particular size. Uh, so shown here is the 18S and 28S peaks for human. So this is an example of an RNA that was uh, analyzed that had very, very high quality. So this is from a cell line. Uh, and if there, this was a gel, you'd have two very bright bands and everything else would be black. So basically there's no smearing. Uh, but instead of running a gel, we're running uh, this sample through a capillary, and then every time you get a band on your gel, you get a, uh, a peak, effectively, instead of a band. So it's like a way of running a gel in a more quantitative way. Um, and on the x-axis, you basically have time. On the y-axis, you have uh, fluorescence units, so how bright uh, the, band, the effective band was. Uh, and because you've run a ladder with known sizes of fragments, you can convert this time into nucleotide sizes. Uh, and then you can analyze this image and come up with a no uh, sort of empirical notion of quality. And you can assign a score. Uh, and the software that comes with this machine will assign an RNA integrity number or RIN number. Uh, and these are commonly reported in RNA sequence experiments. A perfect score is 10. Uh, and a very bad score would be 0. Uh, and the sort of numbers in between give you sort of a crude sense of how degraded your sample is, but I mean, there's various caveats uh, associated with that. <coughs> uh, and what's being shown here is a sample that's degraded where you have, instead of just seeing your two ribosomal peaks, you're seeing those peaks, but also a lot of peaks uh, that are smaller than those two peaks. And basically this is degradation. So you've got uh, RNA of these two sizes being broken into smaller and smaller pieces and creating a smear, and that's interpreted as a series of you know, sort of non-distinct uh, spiky peaks. Uh, and the more of this is going on relative to the, the two peaks that would correspond to intact RNA, the lower your RIN score gets. Uh, and some labs will pick arbitrarily a RIN score uh, that they feel is uh, a minimum. So they'll say if it's less than 8, which is sort of a common number, that we shouldn't try to make an RNA-seq library out of the sample. Uh, and then the next week they'll break that rule because they have some collaborator that really wants the data and, <laughs> and some analyst will be stuck with the problem. Has anybody done any experiments on actually running it and seeing the kind of data you get out? Uh, not deliberately, but uh, <laughs> accidentally all the time. And But yeah, and I can't think of an example where someone has has sort of, I mean, that would be interesting to take a sample and degrade it systematically and produce, like try to identify samples that had RINs 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, produce RNA-seq libraries from each of those and see what effect it has on a variety of downstream applications. That would be really interesting. It's exactly the kind of experiment that should be done but no one will pay for. Um, again, if anyone knows of an experiment like that, please. People have done FFP samples, but I don't know what the end score was. Yeah, I mean, they're bad. I mean, generally for FFP, the, you can easily have, I mean, these scores don't really mean much beyond below five anyways, but I've seen RNA from FFP that's anywhere from, you know, two point something to maybe six or seven would be like a really great RNA sample from an FFP. Um, and generally, yeah, the result is not that great. You tend to have a lot of issues with those libraries. Um, so if you do want to add like RNA sequencing, um, do you find that the 
the question is basically should you worry about the RIN score as much if you're doing a microRNA library? Um, I haven't done that, but I have heard sort of anecdotal accounts that libraries that came from a degraded RNA, even though, like you say, you shouldn't expect it to be as big of a problem, still were problematic, um, but it's pretty anecdotal. I mean, ideally, even though you're dealing with these small species, you still would prefer to have intact RNA, but it definitely should be easier than if you were trying to profile full length, you know, mRNAs that are 2 to 3 kb. Um, it depends on the nature of the RNA degradation. Anything else? Okay. okay, so some design considerations. So I mentioned this um, standards and guidelines and best practices document. Um, it's basically a list of uh, practices relating to um, how you would make the RNA um, but a lot of it has to do with analysis, so what kind of data should you supply, uh, metadata should you supply with data that you deposit to a public repository, uh, how many replicates should you do, what kind of sequencing depth you need, what kind of control experiments you should consider, spike-ins, all of these kind of, it's basically uh, reporting standards, a big list of things that you should do that nobody does. Um, but it's still worth considering, I mean, which of them might be practical to implement in your lab. I mean, that, none of them are bad ideas. Some of them are just costly, time-consuming, increase the complexity of your pipeline, et cetera, and you may decide to try to do without them, and that's what every, you know, everyone is doing that to some degree, but it's definitely worth considering what the best practices are and how close you can pra get to them in practice with, while still meeting you know, your other financial and other considerations. <laughs> So the first one, uh, well, one of the things I mentioned that was replicates, which of course are a very useful thing. So we're going to include the data we're going to analyze today involves replicates. In many experimental designs, you may not have them, but you should really uh, consider, if possible, generating replicates. Uh, and if you do that, what kind of replicates should you make? So there's a variety of different kinds of replicates. So I would sort of have think about three categories, technical, experimental, and biological. Um, technical replicates. It kind of depends on how you think about it, but uh, what a lot of people mean when they say te technical replicate in RNA-seq is uh, taking the same library and running it twice or having two lanes of data generated for the same physical library. Um, and I guess the thing that I would say about that is to probably not bother doing that. Um, I think it's pretty much been established at this point that if you compare one lane of RNA-seq data to the lane beside it, and even to a large extent the next flow cell that runs on that machine or even the next machine over, at least this is for Illumina, um, the results seem very, very consistent. I mean, you generally get very, very, very consistent results um, by comparing a couple lanes. It's not, it's not that much different than just taking a lane and dividing it into two bins and treating those as technical replicates. Unless something has really gone, I mean, you can still have, you still have to watch out for problems. There may be some kind of defect in the flow cell, the machine, you know, may have a power outage, of course things can go wrong, but generally in a production environment when things are move, running smoothly, those kind of replicates, uh, you would, ideally, in an ideal world, you would always do technical replicates, but if you have limited resources, probably not the, the most important thing. Of course, biological replicates are always important if, you, if you're working in a biological system which has variability, which of course it all does, uh, you would want biological replicates. Experimental replicates, I or sort of a third category where, where I would say you take some RNA or even you start at the RNA isolation step and you repeat the whole, like, the whole lab process. You take a sample, you isolate RNA, you make a library from it, and then you sequence that library. That whole process does have variability in it. So now you may have you know, a different operator making the library, different technicians involved, different buffers. I mean, you can try to keep these things consistent, but it's a good idea to get a sense, especially if you're just starting out uh, on a series of RNA-seq experiments to, to get some idea how wild the results are coming out uh, if you process the same cell lines. You take your lint cap cell line and you go through the whole process from tip to tail and then you start back at the beginning and you do it over again on a different day and see how comparable the results are. And do that a couple times and if 
and it may identify problems in your, in your process. Uh, for biological replicates, there's not much I can say other than do them. Um, and it really depends on the nature of the biological question. Um, and you should generally, for both technical and experimental replicates, you should be shooting for a Pearson correlation above 0.9, uh, in my experience. If that, if that isn't the case, then something has probably gone wrong. So what are some of the common analysis goals of RNA-seq analysis? Um, the one we're going to talk about mostly today in the tutorial is gene expression and differential expression. Uh, but one of the reasons people are excited about RNA sequencing is all of the other types of questions that you can ask of the data. So you can look for alternative uh, expression. Uh, you can use RNA sequencing as a, a means of transcript discovery and annotating a genome that previously has not been annotated. It's actually probably the cheapest, most efficient way to annotate the genome now. Uh, you can look at allele-specific expressions. This could be relating to common polymorphisms or to mutations that you identified in, the, in a genome. Uh, you could use your RNA sequence data directly for mutation discovery, and some groups have been doing this. It's challenging, but it can be done. Fusion detection is sort of a hot topic involving RNA sequencing. It'll be interesting to, to have a tutorial on that, but we just don't have time. Uh, RNA editing is also kind of a, a hot topic lately in certain circles um, and fairly controversial, so there's a lot of people interested in that. And there are probably others here that I'm forgetting. Uh, but each of these things uh, has a general theme when you convert them to an analysis workflow. Uh, so I thought I would just go over the, that basic theme. So they generally have some distinct requirements and challenges, uh, but for the most part what you're going to be doing is getting some raw data off an instrument. At this step there will also often be a, a requirement to convert from one file format into another file format. Then there will be an align or assemble step where you're taking your reads and you're aligning them to a reference genome if you have it. And if you do not have it, you're doing some kind of de novo assembly of your reads into transcripts. Then you're going to process these alignments with some tool that's specific to one of the goals that I mentioned on the previous slide. So generally there's a variety of, that's sort of the way these tools get divided out, is they take a BAM file that has alignments already and they examine that BAM in a particular context looking for uh, looking to generate expression estimates or identify alternative isoforms or call variants or whatever. Uh, you, and usually there's sort of separate tools for each of those things. So for example, we're going to use cufflinks for expression analysis. Uh, you could use defuse or chimera scan or something else for fusion detection and so forth. <laughs> After that, these tools, so all of these tools, generally they do not produce a paper for you. So there will be some kind of post-processing step. <laughs> Uh, actually, in actual, actuality, they generally produce a very esoteric, complicated series of output files that only the author of the tool can understand. Uh, so usually there is some kind of uh, further massaging of the data that's required. Uh, and if not that, at, at the very least, there's some kind of visualization or statistics. So usually what you'll, the situation you'll be facing is trying to parse the output of these tools into something that's a bit more digestible and then feeding that output into another uh, tool that will allow you to visualize the data and do some statistics, get some, basically make figures for your paper. Um, and there are some tools sort of that are starting to be developed now that are specifically tailored to summarizing and visualizing the output from these other tools, but I'd say that it's still at this stage it's kind of uh, very, uh, there's not a lot of great tools for that purpose. Um, so there's a lot of custom stuff going on. <clears throat> At the point where you were uh, done code processing, isn't it very analogous to microarray um, Yes, it can be. Um, so actually, the way that we run the tutorial, uh, which you have already done, right? Um, that actually, the tutorial is actually created to to try to produce an output that's as microarray-like as possible. Um, and that can be a conscious decision to, uh, to allow you to feed into pipelines that have already been developed. So a, lot of other, so a lot of things may be very common once you get the data into a format that kind of looks like the format you would get out of a microarray. So you could then feed it into <coughs> pathway analysis or uh, various uh, other types of analyses. But there are other ways of looking Yeah, so the microarrays were never really used for fusion detection or for they were very difficult to use for uh, alternative splicing analysis. So the tools related to that, they were 
just starting to be developed really when, my career, when the next generation sequencing really took off. Uh, and they tend to be quite specific to the design of the microarray, so it can be difficult to get your data into a format that it, it can be very forced to get your data into a format that would allow you to use those tools. Um, so I, in a lot of circumstances, it's more work than it's probably worth. Um, and also, by, by kind of thinking of a, an RNA-seq experiment as a micro experiment, in a lot of ways you're kind of limiting yourself, uh, sort of undoing the advantages of RNA-seq in the first place, which is that you have this ability to profile the transcriptome in a very comprehensive, unbiased fashion. Um, so from a bioinformatics perspective, one of the most annoying things about microarray analysis was being limited by the hypotheses that were phrased by the designer of the microarray. Um, so you're limited by the genes that they put on there, the exons that they profiled, the exon, 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 exon connections that are represented by the probes on the array. Um, and once that's done, it's done. The data can't, if you want to change the design, you have to go back, make a new chip, hybridize, scan, do everything over again. Whereas RNA sequence doesn't have that. You're just randomly sampling the transcriptome. And if you want to think about whether a different gene is there, you learn about some new, new gene in some other experiment. You can just go re-examine the data. You don't have to go through a design uh, step again. That's really one of the like most powerful things about RNA sequencing. Uh, this slide I just kind of threw in there as a, as a resource, uh, listing a few tools uh, for each of the different categories in case someone is interested in a, one of those particular uh, questions that you want to ask of RNA-seq data um, other than expression and differential expression that we're going to talk about. We're really going to focus on this cufflinks, cuff diff pipeline. But there's some others here in case you're interested. And then I was also sort of... Um, plug these two forums, Seek Answers and Biostar, which are sort of complementary. Seek Answers is really uh, a forum that has a lot of, it has a lot of bio, bioinformatics, but also a lot of the lab details, so things about library construction, RNA quality, all these kinds of questions. And pretty much any question that you will ask today, probably someone has asked there, and there may be some useful answers. And Biostar is kind of a similar concept, but really focused on the bioinformatics end of things. So there's endless people talking about which tools they like and problems with those tools and I would highly recommend that you check those out. Yeah. So if you don't have a genome, use, use one of those uh, products to transcript assembly Does any of those actually give you the mapping of the reads after you get samples or would you have to map with a different tool to, to be able to do your, your, your um, official tracking? Some of them include sort of downstream steps to, a, so they have like a step that will be uh, assemble your raw reads into contigs and then they will have some subsequent step that maps the reads back, back to those contigs or attempts to uh, extract read counts from the assembly process uh, and give you some notion of uh, expression level. Um, which ones do I list here? I would say definitely Trinity and Transabyss have some concept of that. Um, how well it works, I think, is uh, these are really like this is a, an area of very heavy active development at this stage. The the whole transcriptome assembly and characterization. Um, for a lot of, I mean, it's kind of do dodging the issue, but for a lot of people that ask me about doing analysis without having a reference genome. Where if, so if you have a lab and you intend to embark on five years of experimentation on a particular model species and you don't have a reference genome, usually my first question is, why aren't you sequencing the genome first, given the cost of genome sequencing at this stage? Um, maybe you should make the reference genome and then uh, proceed to the transcriptome analysis. And there may be good reasons why you can't do that. I mean, it depends on the size of the genome, its complexity, there's lots of, but there, you know, it's worth thinking about. Okay, so the next section is common questions. I don't think any of these common questions have actually been asked so far, but if they have, I'll uh, just gloss over them. Uh, but these are things that t the questions that tend to crop up over and over again, so I just thought we'd go through them. Uh, one question that people commonly ask that's sort of related to a early stages of analysis is should I remove duplicates for RNA-seq? Um, 
Uh, so in DNA, next-gen analysis is very common to remove duplicates. Uh, basically every SNP or mutation calling pipeline has a, a preliminary step that removes duplicates uh, by identifying paired reads that appear to map to the same coordinates and then basically collapsing those down to a single representation. Uh, and the idea there is that uh, you don't expect these duplicates to occur by chance, and if they do occur, perhaps they represent uh, PCR amplification artifacts, uh, and we don't want those in the data set, so we, re we remove them. And a good library, a good whole genome sequence library will not have very many duplicates. You'll uh, look at a BAM before and after uh, duplicate removal, and you'll get a drop of maybe 5% of your reads or 10% of your reads will be removed. And of course, that depends on how deep you sequence the genome, but uh, that's assuming like a 30 to 40x coverage of a genome. A good library will not result in that much removal of duplicates. Uh, in RNA, this is not the case, though. Uh, in RNA, this question is more complicated. Uh, and the reason is that while duplicates may correspond to biased PCR amplification of particular fragments uh, for highly expressed genes, for example, a highly expressed short gene, you expect duplicates to occur just by chance, even if there is no amplification bias. So you can imagine a gene that's only 400 bases long, and it's expressed at 10,000 copies per cell. When you start sequencing deeply a, a library that contains that, those transcripts, just by chance you'll get read duplicates because the species you're sequencing is so abundant. You're just hammering. I mean, you'll, for highly expressed genes, you'll get 10,000x coverage uh, of highly expressed genes from a single lane of data. So you expect these duplicates, and if you remove them, you're uh, effectively collapsing the dynamic range of expression estimates that you can measure uh, from your library. And if, you're, if the goal of your experiment is to determine how highly abundant each species is, that may seem like an unsatisfying thing to do. Uh, so for that reason, a lot of people don't remove duplicates from RNA-seq libraries unless they believe that there's some good reason to do so. So if you perform some analysis and determine that your library seems to have a lot of redundancy, that it's a very low complexity library, then you may change your mind um, and decide to remove them. But it's a, it, it requires a bit more sophisticated analysis than just removing duplicates en masse. So my recommendation usually to people is to, to look at your libraries and try to decide if you think you have a, a duplication problem. And definitely if you do remove them, you should be assessing your duplicates at the level of paired end reads and not single end reads. Um, yeah. Uh, this is going to be a pretty naive question, but the reason when it does PCR is to increase the number of uh, RNAs, and then you take a sample of the total set of RNAs so that you don't have to seek it out. You're first getting more and then getting less. Yes, the question is why why do you do a PCR amplification and then sequence a subset of it? It seems sort of counterintuitive or wasteful. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, in the case of whole genome libraries, so the level of amplification, first of all, is pretty low level. So it would be common to do uh, maybe 10 cycles of PCR, 8 or 10 cycles. Um, and in a lot of cases, we actually do need all that material. So in cancer genomes that we sequence at WashU, for example, we'll commonly make a library from uh, DNA using the standard protocol, and we'll do uh, what we believe is a reasonable amount of amplification that we'll, you don't want to do too much because you'll introduce bias. Um, and then we'll start sequencing, and we'll actually run out. We'll physically run out of material. And then we make another library. We have to make another library to, from the original DNA to continue seek, to get up to 30 or 40x coverage of the whole genome. So in that case, it is just it li literally is to get enough material to run the machine. And my sense is that it that has basically has to do with the way the machine works. You're flowing these molecules across a surface, and you're making clusters of them that can be detected by the imaging system, but that process is not perfect. Not every fragment results in a sequenceable cluster. Um, you just, you need like a certain amount of raw input to the device to get signal out. But there's probably someone like uh, on the technical side of the instruments that would be able to answer that question better than me, if I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
same, but it's the similarly so maybe you think you can compare, but when the expression levels are different, this uh, application can introduce some bias. Yeah, so the question is if you have transcripts that are expressed at different levels or the same level and you introduce a, a PCR amplification step, do you introduce bias such that when you're analyzing the data later you may have lost that actual difference in expression or genes that were expressed at the same level now appear to be expressed at different levels because you did an amplification and that amplification was biased? The answer is, of course, that's a concern. Um, if we could do all of this without any amplification, everyone would love to do that, that for sure. You try to limit the amount of amplification as much as possible. Um, so far, it does not seem to be avoidable. So none of the technology, uh, I mean, Illumina is not doing single molecule sequencing. We can't literally take an RNA and have one RNA, in a, literally one molecule of RNA in a solution and sequence it. Uh, that would be great, but that technology does not exist. But you try to minimize it. So you don't, you don't do any more amplification than you need. Um, and you try to do things consistently so that at least when you're doing this process that you're describing that introduces bias, you hope that that bias is consistent so that when you do it across 50 libraries, you can still compare those libraries to each other. And because the same biases are introduced to each of them, it sort of comes out in the wash um, that it's OK. But we don't really know that that's the case. So all we can do is make predictions and then validate the effectiveness of those predictions. So take some other technology that is very as orthogonal as possible and see does it give us the same answer as what RNA-seq does. And I'll have, I have some slides on that uh, coming up in a few slides. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so is it common to use spike controls in order to normalize for having PCR yeah, so spike-in controls are featured prominently in the on-code best practices document as something everyone should do, which, to my knowledge, no one has ever done. I mean, there was like one paper or two where people described doing spike-ins in RNA-seq. I don't understand why it's so rare, but I have encountered very few data sets that mention anything about spike-ins. There are, of course, I mean, there's no reason why you can't, and there are uh, manufacturers that will provide uh, a series of spike-ins, you know, with that have been generated in some kind of high quality control process that are going to, you'll be able to get them consistently over and over again and you could use them in every library and every time you propose doing this, everyone's like, yeah, it's a great idea, we should do that. And it just, it adds to the complexity of the library construction procedure and that there's a cost associated with that. It's not just the cost of buying the controls, it's the cost of integrating that into the standard operating procedure of your lab, but I think it's definitely a good idea, and we should. And there's no good reason not to not do it that I can think of. As far as I know, I mean, I mean, Illumina is really the king of RNA sequencing right now, so. The others are very kind of fringe by comparison in terms of the numbers of people using them. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not really aware of anything. I mean, in the way that we're doing, we actually have two kinds of, not just amplification, but two different kinds of amplification going on. So we use a kit to make our cDNA synthesis. During that step, there's a linear amplification. Um, and that is before the PCR amplification. So we're actually doing two steps of amplification to allow for low input libraries where we can't get enough RNA to make a library. Um, but yeah, I think for now we're kind of stuck with it. Maybe nanopore will get us away from this somehow. Yeah. So the question is, what is the lowest amount of RNA that you can start with? It's kind of hard to get a sense from that if you're dealing with, so if you're submitting your sample to someone else, to another lab, to a commercial organization that's going to produce your library and sequence it for you, they're going to ask for probably 10 to 20 times as much as they really need, in my experience. And they're going to tell you, no, no, that, that's not the case. They're going to 
say we need all of that or we yeah we keep back half of it in case there's a failure in the lab um, we are typically using at least 100 nanograms generally of total RNA if, that, if you're starting with less than 100 nanograms of total RNA you start to get into a pretty high failure rate in my, in my experience with the kits that we're using but so we're using this um, new gen ovation cDNA synthesis that involves a linear amplification and it seems to work quite well on small amounts of RNA and sometimes it does work just fine below 100 nanograms I don't know the details of how low they've gone and, and been successful and it's it would be too anecdotal at this stage anyways because we may have done it a few times and it worked out but it's hard to get a sense of how reliable it would be until you've tried it a bunch of times, until you've initiated a project where you have a hundred samples and for each of them you only have five nanograms of total RNA and you try to like work with it anyways. I suspect that right now that would be a big challenge though. Usually it doesn't seem to come up that much though, but it depends what you're working with. Yeah. I would say quality is more often an issue than quantity. Yeah. Yeah, so like I said, it really depends. So which center? This is Genome Quebec. Okay, so it really depends on how they make the libraries. So I think we're, the this concept of the Nugen Ovation cDNA synthesis kit is that it has this linear amplification and you can take total RNA and go straight into cDNA synthesis without doing a poly A selection. And that's what allows you to get away with what, such small inputs. Um, and the way they do that is not really clear, so they, the methods are obfuscated. They don't really know what molecular biology exactly is going on, but it involves some amount of random hexamer priming and oligo-DT priming and adding a, a linker that allows linear amplification with a polymerase. And those things all together seem to facilitate somewhat robust li library creation from small inputs. If you were not doing something like that, if you don't want to have oligo DT priming anywhere in your process, which is desirable uh, to avoid introducing N bias. So it's all based on random hexamers. Um, you definitely need you definitely need more input material. Uh, the other so the other one I can compare to is in Vancouver. We would do just random hexamer uh, cDNA synthesis, no linear amplification. They would ask for 10 micrograms uh, of total RNA and they would use five micrograms as input for poly A selection and then make the library from whatever they got out of that. And they tinkered with that poly A selection st step quite a lot to optimize it for yield. Um, but they also wanted so much because they built several libraries from that. So they would make one for RNC, they would make one for chipsy, five different protocols. No, even the app that they started with, they just for RNC. And it, yeah, so that was definitely, they were definitely using more than they needed to, and it hadn't been optimized specifically for purposes of low input. It had been optimized for producing libraries robustly and flexibility in downstream experiments and so forth. Um, but there are definitely a lot of people working on protocols, you know, sort of making libraries in 96 well played format you, or using microfluidics, various things that will allow lower input. Um, and I think that definitely that's going to be an area that will improve in the in the coming years. Any more questions? Zoom in a request two to five microgram RNA per sample. Yeah, so seems like a lot of yeah. let's maybe put the wet lab questions into the concrete just because what you want to get out of it is eventually the Uh, so yeah, I think all of my questions are actually related to bioinformatics analysis. <laughs> all, of, all of these questions. Um, how much library depth is needed for RNA sequencing? So this is another very common question. How many reads do I need to generate? Uh, of course, the answer is, again, not simple, but depends on a large number of factors. Uh, probably the easiest or most obvious is what are you asking of the data? It has a big influence on how much data you need. If you just want to get gene expression estimates out, you don't need that much depth. 
if you want to completely profile and assemble your transcriptome and be able to establish the status of any mutation in any gene, determine the structure of every isoform and so forth, you will need a lot more depth. Um, it also depends on sort of more lab-based things, tissue type, the way you're preparing the RNA, the quality of the RNA, uh, the way you're constructing the library, so things that we were just talking about. Um, the sequencing type to a certain degree, so how long your reads are, whether the reads are paired or not, um, and to a certain degree the computational approach and resources that you have at your disposal. And the answer to the, the actual answer to the question, if people make me pick a number, I usually say shoot for 100 million paired 100 mers, uh, just if you have to have a number. But that's not a very good answer in my opinion. The be a better strategy is to think about what you want to get out of the data uh, and ideally identify someone else who's done something similar and don't do less than what they did. Uh, so basically, if you, if you want to call mutations with RNA-seq data, find a paper where they called mutations with RNA-seq data and you are satisfied with the outcome that they achieved and don't do less than that, do more than that. Um, and even better than that is perform a pilot experiment uh, and sequence very deeply on a small number of samples and try to figure out in your hands, in your lab, with the analysis you're going to use, where is the sweet spot? Basically do a cost-benefit analysis in your own lab. The good news of all this is that you can get a lot of data uh, pretty easily. So one to two lanes of Illumina HiSeq data will generally be sufficient for most of the applications that I described there. What mapping strategy should I use? Another common question. Um, the answer depends largely on read length. Uh, thankfully, we don't really have to deal with these short reads as much anymore, but you do still see some places generating them for cost reasons. So if you have short reads, uh, you may need to use an aligner like BWA uh, against a genome plus junction database. There are a number of publications that took this strategy, uh, and the reason is that when you have short reads, it's hard to map them across exon exon boundaries where you have a large intron in between. So if you have, say, a 40 base pair read and it spans across an exon exon boundary, even if it hit the boundary perfectly centered, you only have 20 bases on either side. And that's a small amount of sequence to map over uh, a large space. Um, so for that reason, you have to map to the genome and some notion of junctions that have already been assembled. Um, but probably, if you're getting data now, starting now, your reads will be longer than 50 bases. In particular, if there's 75 bases or longer, you can go straight to uh, one of the spliced aligners, and that gives you a much uh, simpler uh, output to interpret and feed into downstream analyses. And it's not biased towards the junctions that are in your junction database. It's more comprehensive, and uh, it allows you to identify isoforms that were previously never identified before. So here's just a visualization of this in IGV. Uh, so you should all be familiar with genome browsers. Did they use IGV yesterday? Or just Savant? OK. Yeah. Uh, so this is a screenshot from IGV. Uh, there are three tracks of data being represented here. Normal whole genome shotgun data. So this is a normal sample from a, from a cancer patient. This is a tumor sample from a cancer patient. Uh, these are both DNA. Uh, and then RNA sequence data from the same tumor as the whole genome data. Uh, so each of these gray boxes is reads, uh, and you can see when you align genome reads against, uh, DNA reads against the genome, they all just line up contiguously uh, without being gapped. But when you align your uh, transcriptome reads, some of them span across exon, exon junctions. So for example, this top read here, the first part of the read matches to the end of this exon, uh, and then the rest of the read continues on in this exon. Uh, so basically an aligner determined hey, it looks like this read matches here, but it gets to this point and now it doesn't match this intron. Where does the rest of the read go? It starts looking downstream and it finds, okay, it goes here. Now when we're looking at the data, we can see, oh, it actually lines up with a known transcript, so that alignment is probably correct. Um, but it didn't know about this transcript when it was doing the alignment. It just figured out where that read should go. So what's the sequence in the region of the the sequences in the region of the intron can be several things. So they could be genomic DNA contamination in your RNA sample. 
So you have some amount, you always have some amount of genomic DNA in your RNA sample from which reads could be generated that map anywhere, including in the exons or in the introns. Uh, it could be uh, unprocessed or partially processed RNA, so we enriched for polyadenylated and hopefully processed mRNA, but there's no guarantee that our RNAs have actually been processed, so it could be that the intron hadn't been spliced out of some fraction of the transcripts in our sample, and that would give us reads inside the introns. Uh, it could be a misalignment, or it could be a, a transcript that we don't know about. So it could be that there's a transcript, a real transcript, that has uh, either this whole intron retained, or maybe it uses a different uh, donor site. can't tell which acceptor or donor site, depending on which direction this uh, transcript is being transcribed from. Uh, and then those could be real, correct transcriptome reads. They just correspond to a transcript that isn't being depicted here. How many bases would it require to insert the gap and go over the, the intron? How many? So sort of what is the minimum size of this thing? Uh, the bases, yeah, where they, it would insert a, or, or it would not consider it as an insertion. Or uh, it really depends on the details of the aligner. I would say probably below 10 is pretty hit and miss. Um, and you can tweak the parameters of top hat or whatever gap the liner to play around with how much it will allow. Um, if it's too short, generally it won't attempt. So if, this, if you have a read that hits this exon and just a few bases spill over, it's probably not going to attempt to like place those bases. It's just going to say I'm not quite sure where those last two bases go. Yeah. Are the gaps between reads because of the random sampling? The gaps between the reads. Like for that X on the far, the X on the far left, the gaps that we're seeing between the reads. These. Oh, these. Yeah. Yeah. On the larger. Yeah. So these are just reads that are randomly starting at different positions in this transcript. And ideally, you have reads that just pepper across the transcript, starting and ending all over the place in this. Overall, gives you a nice, clean representation of what the transcript is or the transcripts. Um, and in this case, you can see so these three reads that are marked by stars. So you can see that most reads that span across an exon exon junction, which is what's indicated by this light blue line, which is hard to see with the resolution of this projector. Um, but so, for example, the first three reads here, they span across an exon exon junction. When we look at the known transcript for this region of the genome, there is an exon-exon uh, junction like that that seems to match. Uh, these three reads do not match that junction, but they do seem to correspond to perfect skipping of this exon. So you've got a read that's starting at the end of this exon, and then it continues on, it passes this exon, and it starts at the beginning of this exon. So what that tells us is that there's likely at least two isoforms being expressed from this locus one that includes this exon and one that skips it. And is there a number of reads that you expect to see in order to confidently say that yes, this is a, like an actual transcript or something at least worth validating? Yeah, I don't know if there's a, a particular number, but definitely more than one is good. Um, <laughs> and the software that we're going to use, Cufflinks, tries to take that decision out of your hands. It tries to say, to build a model with a lot of Greek symbols and mathematical wizardry behind it that will uh, attempt to assign confidence to its predictions about what transcripts are present in your sample and assign a p-value and a sort of error bars to help you make that decision. And if you become comfortable with that pipeline, you're using it a lot, you will over time, or maybe at the outset of an experiment, you will perform a series of validations on its predictions to get your own sense in the lab. What can I validate how, uh, based on the p-values it's giving me or the coverage value, you can sort of get a sense of how reliable the estimates are based on your data and the, and the analysis that you're getting. Do you have any uh, yeah, so we're gonna. I'm gonna show you some slides on validations. Next slide, actually. Uh, so this is a common question: How reliable are expression predictions from RNA seq? Uh, so, for example, like in the last slide, are these novel exon exon junctions that we observed? So in that case, we had three reads 
that suggest that an exon was being skipped. Um, and in that case, we had, actually, I didn't mention him, we had an a priori expectation to see that exon being skipped because I had identified a somatic mutation at a splice site in this gene, which would be expected to disrupt splicing and cause that exon to be skipped. And then, lo and behold, we see reads that look like the read that it looks like uh, the exon is indeed being skipped. But just in general, how reliable are these, these predictions that an exon is skipped? And are the differential expression changes that we observe between t two tissues or estimate between two tissues accurate? And how well do they compare to some orthologous uh, techniques such as qPCR? Uh, so I, of course, had this question when I started working with uh, RNA-seq data uh, and I wrote some software to do alternative expression analysis and differential expression analysis uh, of our RNA-seq data and wanted to know how reliable the estimates were that were coming out of that software. So I did about 400 validations, uh, which involved designing qPCR uh, and or RT-PCR and Sanger sequencing experiments to validate predictions. You can read all about that in this publication, uh, but I'll just show you a couple slides from that. Uh, publication first showing a qualitative validation of the first part. So how reliable are these uh, sort of structure predictions? Uh, so for example, exon skipping. So if we imagine a scenario where we have uh, a gene with three exons uh, and the RNA-seq data tells us that we have some amount of exon 2 being skipped so that we're getting two isoforms, one that contains exon 2 and one that skips exon 2. We design PCR primers in exon 1 and 3 to span across the site where the exon is being skipped. Uh, and then we do an RT-PCR. We run the product on a gel, and we expect to see two bands, one for the large isoform that includes exon 2, one for the small isoform that skips exon 2. Uh, and in this case, that's exactly what we saw. Do those sizes match what we would expect? And then if we cut those bands out of a gel and sequence them by a different sequencing technology, in this case Sanger sequencing, and then align those reads back to the genome, do we reciprocate the original finding that the exon was skipped? Uh, so in this case, we've got some Sanger reads. These are about 500 bases now instead of short 50 base pair reads uh, spanning across exon 1 to exon 3 with exon 2 being skipped. So basically went through this process about 200 times. Here's a little snapshot of some of those gels uh, and basically found that in this assay, there was an 85% validation rate. So 85% of the time that the RNA-seq data told me there was an exon being skipped here, I was able to validate that by RT-PCR and Sanger sequencing. And that is a lower estimate because the validation strategy will fail some amount of the time. It's not perfect. It also has its own limitations. Uh, and the technology has improved since then. Uh, the second part, which is more quantitative validation, Sort of a similar idea, we identified a bunch of exons that between two conditions were considered differentially expressed. So in this case, we had a drug-sensitive and a drug-resistant cell line, uh, and there were genes being differentially expressed and isoforms being differentially expressed. We identified a bunch of exons that were predicted to be higher in resistant than in sensitive or vice versa, uh, and we randomly selected a set of about 200 of those to validate, designed exon-specific qPCR primers, uh, and then performed qPCR in uh, a series of biological and technical replicates, uh, and then produced differential expression values from the qPCR output and compared them to the RNA-seq output and plotted them together. So on the y-axis, you've got uh, the difference, log 2 difference between drug-sensitive and drug-resistant, and on the x-axis, you've got the same log 2 dif dif difference between drug-sensitive and drug-resistant, uh, and you can see that you get a very a uh, good correlation uh, between the two technologies. And if you apply a statistical test to both uh, data sets and ask which of these things are statistically significant, differentially expressed, and then see how often the two technologies agree, you get an 88% validation rate. So again, it's basically, this tells us that if we could do uh, qPCR for every exon in the entire transcriptome, you would get a readout that is similar to what the RNA-seq data is giving us as a one-shot deal, uh, which is very nice. Okay, so now we're going to do just a brief introduction to the tutorial and then take a break and start with the tutorial when you come back. So I just have this one slide. 
And I'm going to try to like keep referring back to this so that we know sort of where we're at in the process. But basically, we're going to start with three general types of input data. Uh, we're going to have raw sequence data in the form of FASTQ files, just like the ones you were working with yesterday, except today they're going to be RNA reads instead of DNA reads. We're going to have a reference genome, again, just like we had yesterday. Uh, but in the tutorial today, it's just going to be chromosome 22 so that the tutorial runs quickly. But in a normal situation, it would be a fast a, a, a database or file representing your whole reference genome for whatever species you're analyzing. Uh, and then we're going to have some gene annotations uh, as a GTF file. And I'll explain a bit more uh, what the features of a GTF file are. Each of these things is going to be fed into a pipeline that involves uh, taking our raw reads, doing a read alignment. We're going to use Bowtie and Top Hat to do this alignment uh, to the genome. Uh, and it's actually going to be a combined genome transcriptome alignment. Uh, and then a transcript compilation step, which will involve cufflinks examining all of the read alignments and trying to figure out what transcripts are present and how highly expressed each of those transcripts are present. Uh, and then Cufflinks will also compare the transcripts that it finds to the known transcripts that we supplied in our gene annotation file. And then we're going to take the output from uh, the Cufflinks process and do a comparison between two tissues. So in our case, it's going to be colon tumor versus colon normal. Uh, and then we're not going to get to this part, but uh, the authors of this pipeline have also added a visualization step where you can take the output of this final step and feed it into this R tool that will help you visualize uh, the results.